Alright, so before we go any further with this video, I want you to take a look at this painting right here. And I want you to explain in your notes what makes that a piece of Renaissance art. Oh, shoot, darn, I just gave the answer away, didn't I? Well, what I want you to do is I want you to explain what makes that video, or that picture right there, a piece of Renaissance art. So, pause the video and write it down. Alright, now that you've paused the video and written that down, uh, let's go ahead and talk about two really important Renaissance artists. Um, the major Renaissance artists that you guys need to know about are, one, Michelangelo. Michelangelo, Michelangelo Buenoarto uh, lived from 1475 to 1564. Uh, didn't really have any one single city that he lived in. Um, and the medium that he really preferred was all of them. Um, the two guys that we talk about are going to be pretty major players in all of the Renaissance, and both of them are what we would consider the Renaissance men. So if you, you think back to what Castiglione um, described as the typical Renaissance man, both of these guys are the Renaissance men. So we'll take a look at some artwork by Michelangelo here in a minute. But the other one is probably some guy you all have heard of. Um, uh, multiple times in all sorts of different manners, uh, but that's Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci um, was born in 1452, died in 1519, um, worked all over Italy, worked throughout um, Europe, really, actually worked uh, a lot, quite a bit in France, um, but he was also really well known for all mediums, and, and Leonardo is kind of your stereotypical Renaissance man, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, take a look at three different things from each guy, uh, three or four different things from each guy, and we're going to talk about what makes each of those things a piece of the Renaissance. Okay, so first of all, let's start out with Michelangelo. For one, uh, this is called the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. Write that down. The Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. B-A-S-I-L-C-A. Basilica. Okay, B A S. I-L-I-C-A, okay? St. Peter's Basilica, it's the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. This dome right here has a huge impact on world history, a tremendous impact. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the Reformation, but that right there, I'm telling you right now, plays an impact, okay? So first of all, what makes it Renaissance? Well, take a look at these columns. These columns here are Greek, or maybe they're Roman, to be honest, I don't know. But the, the columns throw back to the age of the Romans and the Greeks. And remember, that's what the Renaissance is all about. Okay, two, the very fact that it's a dome is Greek and Roman. All right, so the dome of St. Peter's Basilica, the big Catholic church um, uh, in Rome, uh, it's pretty important. Two, Michelangelo's David. Now, Michelangelo's David is a sculpture, obviously. And Michelangelo's David, if you'll think about the characteristics of the Renaissance, and one of the, the things there is that their art shows more emotion, is more realistic. You're looking at this guy going, hang on, wait a minute. I don't know you about you, but I don't know many people that look like that. This is an idealized form of a real human. Okay, so I want you to take this in two ways. One, this is obviously King David from the Bible. Uh, that defeated Goliath. Okay, so you've got the boy King David going out to fight Goliath. So one, it's not a sculpture of God. Okay, for two, it's a sculpture of an earthly man um, who's just a man. There's nothing particularly special about it. But if you also think back to the Renaissance, I want you to think about something. What made the Renaissance unique? Well, one of the aspects was humanism, and that's what makes it a departure from the old times, the reliance on the church, everything comes from God. But humanism, this belief or idea of human, this belief in human ability, okay, I'm going to show you how this painting right here illustrates human ability. Well, let's think about things. If we're humans, what do we do, do things with? What do we build with? We build with our hands, right? Okay, so if we have hands. We can do a lot of things. If we have a brain, we can do a lot of things. So I want you to take a look at him. And the rest of Mike of Michelangelo's David 
is in perfect proportion with what an actual real human would be, except for one aspect, and that's his hands. If you look at his hands, his hands are enormous. I don't know about your hands, but if I'm comparing my hands to the rest of my body, then they're not that big. See, you can't get away from my text messages sound anywhere. Um, so my hands are proportional to my body, a little small even maybe. Okay, but Michelangelo's hands are actually huge. They are wildly out of proportion with his body. So I'm going to take a little little arrow here, and I'm going to circle Michelangelo's hands. It's going to take a while to do this. So I'm going to circle his hands. Michelangelo's hands are big because it illustrates that humans have the ability in our own hands to do and create our world. Not in our head, not from God, not anywhere else. But on our own, we have the ability to create our own world. I think that's pretty cool, and Michelangelo fully intended to do that. All right, so let's take another look at a piece of artwork by Michelangelo, and that's the ceiling of the Ch Sistine Chapel. Again, Michelangelo laid on his back for years um, on scaffolding, painting this fresco, dot, 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 dot. Again, fresco or painting in white plaster, or dry, wet plaster. So... Here's how this painting illustrates, or is, of the Renaissance. The image to the right is God. The man here on the left is Adam. I want you to notice something unique about the hands. Which one is reaching out to the other? Is it Adam reaching out to God? God, help me, save me, create me. By the way, I call this the spark. I don't know what it's actually called. But this is the focal point or the center of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel where there's all sorts of other things going on. This is just zoomed in on it. So who's reaching out to whom here? Does Adam really appear to need God? It's your call. What do you think? If who is reaching out to whom? In my opinion, it looks like God is reaching out to Adam. It certainly does not look to me like Adam is reaching out to God like, Oh God, I need you. No, not at all. So let's take a look about that and think about that. What does that say about the Renaissance? Nextly, we've got Leonardo da Vinci. This is one of his most paintings, if not the most, The Last Supper. Uh, it took him three years to complete this. This is a huge mural, basically. It's on an entire wall of a building. Okay, So this huge painting, sorry, that was probably a lot wrong. Take a look, see where I'm wrong there, find out where Leonardo's Last Supper is and See if you can't find that out. That's that's an extra credit assignment if you want. I'll give two points to the first person who tells me where Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper is, when it was painted, well, when it was painted, you see, um, and how big it is and where it is right now. Um, so you see the painting here, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth sitting here in the middle, um, and then we've got Mary Magdalene. Now, there's all sorts of imagery that we could talk about for days about this. But one of the things that I want you to know, what makes it Renaissance, is the use of proportion. We've got the angled lines here, clearly drawn, drawing your eye to the center of the painting. Right here, Christ is at the center of the painting. Uh, many people believe that this arrow, uh, the fact that there is a triangle going up, draws your eye to the center. And then here's a vacant space or a triangle going down. Uh, also helps to pull your eye to that. Um, but again, this is a scene from the Last Supper, uh, immediately before the day before Christ was uh, led to trial, and then um, well, obviously shortly before he was crucified. But anyway, so the Last Supper is a piece of Renaissance art because things are drawn in proportion. There's the clear use of perspective. The table's at the front of the room, and everything else is in the back. All right. So let's look at some more. Uh, this is <coughs> excuse me. This is a painting called the Vitruvian Man. Uh, in his attempt to try to realistically portray uh, human form. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a scientist. He would study human form. He, he would even go so far as to study cadavers, that's dead bodies, um, and, and look at them. And here's some of, and there's one of his drawings, the Vertruvian man, the Vertruvian man uh, that he draws there, um, was in one of his sketchbooks, one of his books. Um, and lastly, but not leastly, perhaps his most famous painting uh, is the Mona Lisa. It took him three years to complete this. Um, and here we see that she is a realistically portrayed woman. 
Uh, she is not a looker by any imagination. Look, she doesn't even have eyebrows. Um, but anywho, she um, she's just your average everyday woman. Now, uh, you can look on your own and find out who she was, but what makes this Renaissance? Well, you can see, again, use of probably the use of triangles in his drawing. There's some focal point behind her head. She obviously is a little bit of a triangle there. Um, but the use of perspective, look at the background. Again, great detail like the other ones we've talked about. Rivers or roads leading to a creek or a stream back here. Um, things going on water mountain okay um, trees in the background great detail in the background human form realistically portrayed again it's a it's a painting of a real person okay she actually did exist there's all kinds of history behind it I won't go into that right now because we don't really need to um, but again the focus on the human form as it actually exists is one of the major characteristics of the Renaissance one more thing about the Vitruvian man Again, what makes it Renaissance? The focus on humans. The focus on who we are. The focus on what we actually are. All right, so how did the ideas of the Renaissance spread? Well, first of all, we've got to think about a couple of different ways of how ideas spread anyway. First of all, we've already talked about trade and how the ideas of trade moved or rather trade moved ideas so there's one way but a second way that ideas spread was Italy at the time of the Renaissance was the center of a whole intellectual blossoming or resurgence in Europe and so what a lot of people did is they would send their kids wealthy people obviously the nobility obviously would send their children down to Italy to be educated at their universities and so they, when they came back from college, when they came back from studying down there, would bring the ideas back. But probably more so than anything else that had an impact on spreading the ideas of Europe and the ideas of the Renaissance, particularly to the North and how the Northern Renaissance spread and came from the Southern Renaissance was the printing press. The printing press was invented in Europe in the 1450s by a guy named Johann Gutenberg. So the printing press invented in 1450s by Johann Gutenberg helped to spread the ideas of the Renaissance because what it did was it easily moved um, type. You could print things quickly and more importantly you could print things cheaply. Books, remember we've talked about this, monks had to set in and, and copy books basically for years and it took a long time and it was very expensive to have a copy of any book the Bible the newspaper whatever so ideas became more became cheaper easier to access because what happened was people could buy things more cheaply another impact of the printing press was things called broadsides which are basically just big posters were easily printed now and these big posters or broadsides could spread the word about what was going on in the town. It was sort of like your town newspaper. And they would take things and they would stamp them on the church door. The main church was like the, where everybody went for their news. So they'd nail them to the church door. Dong, 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 dong. And that's where they got their news. And these broadsides were, would help ideas spread more quickly. So as ideas spread more quickly, more people began to read. And as more people began to read, they began to want more books. And so as soon as books were cheaper, there was a higher demand. And so um, people began, began buying and reading more books. So what ideas were they? They got published um, in these books. Well, some of the ideas uh, were put forth by a guy named Desiderius Erasmus. He's somebody who's really important. You really need to know who Erasmus was. Well, you can see the years of his life. And Erasmus was a writer in the Northern Renaissance. He, he lived in what is modern day Belgium or uh, the Netherlands. <coughs> and so, what Erasmus was famous for, he was what we'll call a Christian humanist. He was a Christian through and through, believed in God, believed in you know, everything that Christians believe. But he also believed that not that humans didn't have to rely only on God. He didn't believe in superstitions. 
uh, he was very logical about the way that he approached his life. And, and he believed as a humanist um, in our natural ability to understand and communicate directly with God. And so, and he didn't believe in, again, many of the superstitions of the Catholic Church. And so he wrote a book called In Praise of Folly. And you need to know that. That's very important you need to know. Um, and, and he wrote this book basically making fun of all the superstitions in the church. And he, one of the things that he disagreed with was the ceremony of the church. And the ornateness of the church. He didn't believe that it had to be so elaborate. Yes, it might honor God in the multiple steps that you take to say a prayer to him or to communicate with God. But some of the things that, that the church did were simply um, ceremony for the sake of being ceremony. So they were too elaborate. Um, and he thought that the beliefs and the actions himself were wrong. Well, Erasmus had a student whose name was Thomas More. Uh, Thomas More was an Englishman, uh, lived from 1478 to 1535, as you can see right there. And Thomas More and didn't exactly um, criticize the church, but what Thomas More did was Thomas More criticized European society. And when Thomas More criticized European society, he wrote a book called Utopia, in which he described the perfect society. He said, this is where everybody ought to live. Now, it was fiction. And he actually didn't say this is where everybody ought to live. He, he pretended that he took a trip to this perfect world where everyone was equal. And one day the king would be, well, the king. And then the next day the king would be the trash keeper. And because everyone had an equal role in society and would eventually have every other job in society, they treated each other much better. Um, and he was really criticizing the level and the separation in English society and all European society as well. And lastly, but not leastly, is somebody we're not going to spend a ton of time on, but it's very important and you need to know who William Shakespeare was. Again, English literature probably reaches its peak, many people think, with William Shakespeare. 1564 to 1616 were his, um, the times of his life. Now, obviously, Shakespeare is well known for writing sonnets, uh, which are those 14 line poems that we talked about earlier, and plays, and um, he's known because he portrays human life. He portrays real events emotionally um, as they relate to everybody. The reason you guys still read Shakespeare's plays today is because everybody can relate to Shakespeare. I mean, it, it, there's not a person among us who can't relate to something in one of his stories. So what I want you guys to do right now is you guys are going to read a video, or read a sonnet. And I want you to take a look at this sonnet, who was written to an imaginary woman, maybe, Made it on. Um, not really. Um, it, it was written to this woman and this woman that he loved, and he talks about her. And I want you to think about how he talks about her. It's not exactly complimentary, but what is it about this poem that makes it Renaissance? So I'm going to change to the next slide, and I want you to pause it, read it, think about it, and write your answer down. You know, ready, set, go. Take a look and. All right, good. So you've had a chance to read it. Write down what you think. If you've got some thoughts on it, we'll take a thought, take a look at those, and we'll talk about that on Wednesday when I'm back in class. So here's your video quiz. Okay, now you've got to listen to the quiz, and it's time for you to take out your daily review sheets that look and flip to the back so they look like this. That's right, right there. You need this sheet. So number one, I want to know. Was Michelangelo a Renaissance or a medieval artist? So, A, Renaissance, B, medieval. Number two, what was really large on David? Was it A, his hands, B, his feet, C, his noggin, or D, his legs? A, hands, B, feet, D, his head, or I'm sorry, C, his head, or D, his legs? Three. Leonardo da Vinci, Renaissance or Medieval? A for Renaissance, B for Medieval. By the way, go back to number one. Was it A, Renaissance, B, Medieval? Hmm, I don't know. I'm not sure. So, which of the following, question number four, which of the following were not created by Leonardo da Vinci? Was it the Mona Lisa, the Last Supper, 
the protruding man? Or did he create the dome of St. Peter's Basilica? Was he the major architect there? Again, which of the following were not created or credited to Leonardo da Vinci? A. The Mona Lisa. B. The Last Supper. C. The Vitruvian Man. Or D. The Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. Number five. Which of the following guys was not a northern renaissance writer? Was it A. Erasmus. B. Dante. C. Thomas More. Or D. William Shakespeare. Again, number five, which of these was not a northern renaissance writer, was it A. Erasmus, B. Dante, C. Thomas More, or D. William Shakespeare. And your last question, number six, which did not contribute to the spread of the renaissance? Talk about several things that contributed to the spread of the renaissance to the north, which didn't really help at all. Was it A. The printing press, B. Trade, C, students traveling from the north to the south to get educated and then back to the north again. Or D, did the rats carry the ideas in little scrolls wrapped up in collars that they would wear back and forth. So A, printing press. D, C, B, trade. C, students going from the south, from the north to the south and back again. Or D, rats. So that's your quiz. If you got to watch it again, watch it again. Talk to you guys later. Have a good one.